Today we're going to be talking about pickleball and injuries related to pickleball, as well as how to prevent these injuries. You've already seen our introduction. And so, you know, pickleball is this game for all ages, all abilities, very competitive, especially the pickleball players that I see in clinic. It started in 1965 by a gentleman named Joe Pritchard. He and his two friends decided to invent this game just to entertain their kids. The first official court was actually built in his backyard in 1967, and the first tournament was held in 1976. Pickleball Association, the USA Pickleball Association, was formed in 1984. And in 2003, there were 39 official courts in the North America. In 2008, that bumped up to 420, only five years later. In 2020, over 4,000, almost 4,000 pickleball courts in North America. And it's almost an Olympic sport. So it's played in 70 countries. In order to become an Olympic sport, it needs to play in 75 countries. And so we could very well be seeing pickleball in the Summer Olympics coming up. So just the basics, I'm sure most of you are pickleball players, but for those that aren't, the basics are that it's a court that's kind of designed around a tennis court, but it's much smaller. You can see the picture up here on the top right. It shows what a tennis court looks like, kind of that dark green color. The pickleball court is the blue court in the middle. It's played on a smaller court than a tennis court. The, low, the net height is a little bit lower, and it can be indoor or outdoor. The rackets, I mean, a good way to describe them is kind of a cross between a tennis racket and a ping pong paddle, but slightly bigger than a ping pong paddle, slightly smaller than a tennis racket. Um, and the ball is a waffle type ball. You can play doubles or singles. All right, so overview of the lecture, we're gonna talk about lower extremity injuries and then upper extremity injuries, some initial treatments for those, as well as ways to prevent it. And that's where Melinda's really gonna come in. Um, I always spend a lot of time on anatomy because I really feel that if you have an injury, especially if it's an orthopedic injury, you should really be focusing on where is it? What muscle is it? What bone? What tendon? Instead of just going to Dr. Google, Dr. Google will tell you you have knee cancer and that's pretty rare. So focusing on anatomy and you can say, oh, actually it's my patellar tendon that's really inflamed and irritating. And then even do some self-care and self-treatment by utilizing other resources on the internet like YouTube. Okay, so just a word about sport-related pain. So pain that actually improves as you work out is usually soft tissues, muscles, tendons. They're usually the result of overuse or overtraining. And as your body warms up, they actually feel better. Pain that actually worsens during a workout to the point where you may even have to stop mid-workout or mid-game, then we start worrying about bone injuries or osseous injuries, fractures, stress fractures, avulsions where tendons are pulled off of um, bone. Um, torn or partially torn tendons or muscles. So things that are a little bit more serious when pain is so severe, you have to stop playing. So lower extremity injuries that we're gonna talk about today, muscle strains of the lower extremity, knee sprains. I should have put that in quotes, um, the sprain part and then ankle sprains. Ankle sprains are one of the most common injuries in pickleball. So anatomy, so we're talking about the bones, the hip bone, the hip bone, <laughs> the hip is a ball and socket joint and the bone that goes in or the ball of that socket is the femur. When you go below that, you have the shin bones which are the tibia and the fibula. The patella is actually called the, the kneecap um, in common terms. And then when you get into the foot, you have the tarsals, the metatarsals and the phalanges. Muscles of the lower extremity. So we have our thigh muscles, our glutes and our calf muscles. So our thigh muscles are composed of our quadriceps, which are on the front of the thigh, and the hamstrings, which are on the back of the thigh. The quadriceps are actually made out of four muscles, and these muscles are involved in helping to extend the, the hip and the knee out. So the rectus femoris, vastus lateralis, vastus intermedialis, and vastus medialis. The hamstrings are used to help flex the knee back, kind of like kicking your butt. And so not on the court, <laughs> just like literally like if you brought your heel to your butt. Um, the hamstrings are made up of three muscles, semimembranous, semitendinous, and the biceps femoris. The glutes, which gives us that butt shape, the buttock shape, is involved with actually extending our hip back. And then we have the IT band, which is actually on the side of the leg. And this helps with stabilization of the pelvis. And so you can imagine if you're doing a one-legged, like quick stride to the side to catch the ball or to hit the ball back, the IT band is actually involved with helping to keep your pelvis level. Otherwise you'd have a sinking pelvis and that actually can cause different types of injuries. 
and um, the deeper muscles of the thigh and the hip. So on the inner thigh, we have the adductors, which are all muscles that help to kind of bring the leg across the body. And then hip flexure, which is actually the hip flexure is actually kind of cool. It comes from the back, the lumbar spine, the psoas muscle, and it joins the iliacus muscle. And the two together, the iliopsoas create the hip flexor. The pectineus muscle is a smaller muscle that's just below the hip flexor, which all of these together help bring our hip up and kind of, you know, as we're taking a step forward, they're involved with bringing that hip upward. Deeper hip and thigh muscles. So the gluteus maximus, right, the thing that makes our butt shape. And then you have the gluteus medius, which is the smaller muscle that helps with pelvic stabilization. Below that is the gluteus minimus, which actually helps to kind of rotate our leg out to the side. And so when you have low back pain or, you know, back of the pelvis pain, it actually might be some of these muscles that are just getting a little bit of overuse without getting proper stretching. External rotators. So these are the, you know, these are interesting because they're very deep in the back. They're almost like right up against the, the sacrum um, in the back part of the pelvis, the piriformis, the superior uh, gemellus, the upturner, obturator internus, and the inferior gemellus. All of these are involved with, again, laterally, laterally rotating that hip outward. And then we get into the lower leg. So this is below the knee. And we have um, kind of the front part of the knee or the front part of the leg, the anterior compartment. And then you have the back part of the leg, um, which is more involved with plantar flexion, pointing the toes. The front compartment is still more with anterior or dorsiflexion, which is kind of bringing the foot back as opposed to pointing the toes. So the tibia, tibialis anterior is involved with flexing the foot upward and kind of inverting it a little bit. Um, the external extensor digitorum and the fibularis groups are also involved with flexion as well as eversion, so kind of rolling that foot out instead of rolling it in. On the back part, you have your calf. The gastrocnemius is what creates that teardrop shape in the back part of your leg. And then the soleus is a kind of a, the reason we call it the soleus is because it's, um, it looks like a fish and it's like Latin for fish, soleus. And so it's this broad muscle that actually goes right along the backside of the shin, but it's quite deep to the gastrocnemius muscle. And then when we go even deeper than that, we've got the popliteus, the posterior, the tibialis posterior, the flexor, the flexor digitorum, and the flexor hallucis longus. All of these are involved with um, rotation of that area, plantar flexion, so pointing the toes again, um, as well as making sure the playing the big toe, which is the, really the big goal of the flexor hallucis longus. Tendons and ligaments. So tendons, people say, oh, I've got tendonitis, right? Tendons attach muscle to bone. Ligaments attach bone to bone. Ooh, I don't know if you heard that one. That was my, I think that was my five-year-old. Um, tendons and ligaments. So the quadriceps tendon. So this is the tendon that involves with attaching the thigh muscle to the top of the patella. The patellar ligament, we say patellar tendonitis all the time, but the patellar ligament attaches the kneecap or the patella to the tibia below it. The pes anserine tendon, this muscle is, uh, this tendon attaches the hamstring on the inside, kind of comes down along the inside of the knee and attaches in the front of the tibia. So some people will get pain on the inside of their knee and it's actually their hamstrings because their hamstrings are so tight. And then the posterior tibialis tendon and the perineal tendon, these are down at the ankle as well as the Achilles tendon. So these are all muscles that attach to bone that are involved with different stabilization of the knee. So let's talk about our first set of injuries, muscle strains. So you're gonna see pictures here on the right that are gonna indicate which muscles are being strained. So a groin strain or an adductor strain, remember that's the muscle that kind of pulls the leg across the body. Hip flexor, so you're gonna feel pain kind of right there at the anterior part of your hips, either one, sometimes one more than the other, especially if you tend to be a little bit more like right leg dominant or left leg dominant. The quadriceps, you can get muscle strains in the quadriceps from launching, jumping, leaping, um, kind of fast, forceful movements. Hamstring, obviously, along either side of the back part of the thigh. And then the gastrocnemius or calf strain, which calf strains are actually really common as well in pickleball. Achilles too, you can even get Achilles strains at the very, very base of the heel. So kind of the initial treatment, we love rice, right? Rest, ice, compression, elevate. But that's hard, right? Because you want to play pickleball. You want to be out there on the court. Um, but we still do recommend rest. I say heat and then some gentle stretching, then followed by ice. Um, some of these different devices here on the side, I actually have that top roller. I love it. I keep it in my freezer, pop the handle on, rub out a sore muscle after a, a gentle workout to kind of work out any kinks that I might have. Um, and I find it's just 
really helpful and easy to use. Um, I'd also recommend gentle workouts. So if you have like a hip flexor strain or quadricep strain or a hamstring strain, you still want to be lightly active. And so walking on flat ground or biking on flat ground or using the elliptical are a great way to kind of get that muscle to warm up a little bit, kind of decrease the pain and then follow it with some stretching and some ice. Compression, I love thigh sleeves, calf sleeves. They can really help to support a muscle that's injured as you're getting back to activity. Um, topicals, things like Voltaren gel, which is over the counter, Salon Paz, um, Asper cream, any of these types of topicals can be very helpful. The girl down here at the bottom has a foam roller. If you don't have one, I would very, very strongly recommend that you invest in one. Um, I think I bought one like, gosh, I want to say like 20 years ago, and I still use it because, you know, as you're active, you have sore muscles that need to be rolled out and stretched. And sometimes they're a little bit harder to get to. And so a foam roller can really be a nice way to get to like the IT band. Like that's exactly what she's stretching out right now. Okay, knee, I put in quotes, sprain, right? Um, because in orthopedics, we don't really say knee sprain. <laughs> we are a lot more specific than that. And so the circles that you see right here, that red circle is the quadricep and then, so that could be a quad strain on either inner or outer side of the knee. You could have an MCL sprain or an LCL sprain. Those are ligaments that are on either side of your knee that help with side to side stabilization. The patellar tendon, which we know is actually the patellar ligament, right? But we still call it the patellar tendon. Um, that can be strained as well. And then that green circle, that's that pes anterior tendon. It comes around from behind the cat, behind the thigh, and then wraps around and attaches right there. You can actually have and I just from any of these things, but a lot of it comes back to, you know, is, are you flexible enough? Um, not flexible enough, but being careful and making sure that you do a good stretching routine following a workout. So symptoms, this can be sudden or gradual. So this could be nagging you for a while and then all of a sudden really starts to hurt or you jumped weird and immediately felt a twinge or a pull and you're like, ooh, that doesn't feel right. Or maybe you had a fall on the court and kind of twisted your knee and that caused a sudden painful injury. Location, 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 right? So you pull up your anatomy pictures on Google and you try to point out, where is it? Where am I hurt? Oh, that's where I'm hurt at that LCL ligament. Oh goodness, maybe I need to see somebody. I don't know, let's just, let's just see if I can rehab it a little bit. So when you rehab it, you definitely want to be icing it, resting it a little bit. Um, the pain can be very sharp or it can be very tearing. You can even see swelling. Um, some of the risk factors I kind of alluded to, just like inflexibility, tight muscles, maybe a lack of a warm up. You know, you just kind of jumped right out of the car, jumped on the court and got going. Um, may, not stretching after a workout. Yeah, jump back in the car and pick up the kids <laughs> or somebody else, you know, the dogs in the bed or wherever. Um, diagnosis is generally pain with palpation on exam and certain provocative movements that a provider might try to see if it um, is torn or injured. And then x-ray, just to make sure we're not dealing with anything bone related. Um, we can even consider doing ultrasound to look and make sure that the tendon is intact. Um, and then consider an MRI too, especially if something's not getting better or not following a, a course that we would like to see. So here's just kind of looking at the different anatomy, right? We love anatomy. Um, and then the initial treatment. So it could be tendonitis, but it also could be bursitis. So I didn't really talk about, I'm gonna go back just a second. So bursitis, there's fluid filled sacs under each of these different tendons that help to protect the tendon from shredding itself basically back and forth over a bone. And so when a muscle or a tendon is tight, it actually compresses that bursa sac and can cause bursitis. And so bursitis and tendonitis really look very similar. And even the treatment for them is very similar, uh, but it could be bursitis. And that's something that on, on MRI or ultrasound and consider treating with maybe a targeted injection or something like that in addition to physical therapy. So ice, right? Tylenol, we love that. Topicals, that's great for the knee. Actually, it's great for topicals. It's easy to kind of point out right where you need to put it in order to feel better. Stretching, right? So that pes anterior tendon, if that's what's going on, you need to be stretching those hamstrings. The quadriceps needs to be stretched, the hip flexors. Pickleball is very lower body intensive, all the jumping, all the lunging, all the moving, all the twisting. And so, you know, the lower body needs to be stretched as well as the back. The back connects to the lower body. And if there's tightness in the back, that's going to create tightness along that whole posterior chain. Um, trying to decrease the intensity of play. One of my least favorite things to do is take people out of a game or out of their sport. Um, I generally only do it if I do for a short period of time and then gradually get them back in, but it's with the understanding that you want to play at a decreased intensity level um, because you don't want to get out there, start feeling really good, push it too fast, and then you're right back to square one. 
Um, also cross training with uh, walking, biking, or swimming is great too. And if you're still, after you tried some doing some self-treatment, if you're still having a lot of pain after a couple of weeks and aren't able to progress back to the same level of activity, then it may be worth coming and seeing an orthopedic doctor just to see, you know, what's going on? Am I missing something? Um, should I be doing something else? To treat this? Okay, ankle sprain one of the number one injuries for pickleball. This is why I put the big stars there. <laughs> um, so it is the most common injury in pickleball. It's generally sudden, you have an inversion, meaning that the picture here up at the top, you kind of rolled your foot inward um, and you can get a lot of pain, a lot of swelling, bruising can just be horrific looking. Like you just think, oh my gosh, is it gonna get worse? The, the reason bruising gets so bad is because gravity is just not your friend, right? I see this all the time, gravity is nobody's friend, right? But in the world of a lower extremity injury, even more so less of a friend because gravity causes the bruise to kind of elongate and travel down into the toes. The swelling travels down from the ankle into the toes. And so you get a, a pretty impressive looking injury. Risk factors for this is if you've had a previous ankle sprain, um, the idea of weak ankles, um, once you've rolled it, those ligaments are a bit more lax, the proprioception fibers of our nerves think, oh, that's okay to roll my ankle that far. Like, it's not a big deal. Um, and so your body doesn't understand like, whoa, 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 that's actually not good to roll my ankle that far. And so things like physical therapy can help kind of retrain your body to know, okay, that's now I've got more stability in my ankle and it won't roll as far. Um, inappropriate footwear. So footwear that, you know, may not be great for the court, um, especially if it corrects for something like pronation or supination and you're lunging and moving and jumping, you could be setting yourself up to actually have a little bit of an ankle roll or a, a tilt in your foot as you're landing that football. And so you could be contributing to having it roll one way or the other. Um, sometimes uh, we see fractures in pickleball players when they've had a really severe sprain, especially in the setting of lower bone density. So if somebody has osteopenia or osteoporosis, you know, these are things that can contribute to having a fracture and not just a sprain. I mean, I gotta tell you, a fracture and a sprain, often they look very similar because there's so much swelling, so much bruising, so much discomfort. So diagnosis is generally with an exam and of course getting an x-ray just to rule out a fracture. Um, the ATFL anterior anterior tubule fibular ligament is the most commonly sprained ligament in the entire human population, not just the pickleball population. All right, and so initial treatment, again, we like rice, rest, ice, compression, elevate. I also say that when you elevate, especially if it's the lower extremity, right, gravity is not our friend, you wanna make sure you're doing those, those calf pumps so that way you're helping the um, mechanisms that are in place to decrease the amount of swelling in the ankle. I like to start with gentle range of motion as well, especially if you know that there's not a fracture and that's doing circles, squares, capital letters of the alphabet. And then bracing is nice because it can give you just a little bit of added stability, especially if you get back out on the court um, and you're gonna be kind of doing some gentle decreased intensity playing. Uh, it can just give you that added stability. And if not improving in 48 hours, then again, I would recommend seeing a physician, especially if you're having a hard time weight bearing because we wanna make sure you haven't fractured like the fibula or anything else. Okay, moving into upper extremity. So upper extremity injuries that we're gonna talk about are shoulder or rotator cuff tendonitis, the elbow epicondylitis. We've got the tennis elbow and golfer's elbow. Um, even though it's pickleball, you can still get golfer's elbow. And then in the wrist, um, sprains and fractures. Okay, so again, right, we're gonna start with anatomy. And so in the upper bone, we are in the upper arm, we have the humerus, which is where our biceps and triceps are. The radius and all in all make up our forearm. I'm a very hand talker. So if you're watching, you're probably, what's she doing? I'm just showing you where, I, where the bones are. And then you've got the metal carpals and then the flanges, which are our fingers. All right. And now talking about the muscles of the upper extremity, we're actually going to start with like the chest and the back because our shoulder girdle is held on by our chest muscles and our rotator cuff muscles. Um, and so in the chest, we have our pecs, which obviously are the, you know, the chest muscles that come right across the front. Then in the back, we have the trapezius muscle, which is actually kind of up in this area. It's actually this nice, big, broad, beautiful trapezius looking muscle kind of across the upper part of the back. And then we have the levator scapulae, which are the muscles that actually help raise our scapula up. And then the rhomboids, which are underneath our scapula, and they actually help to hold our, sca our scapula down. And then in the shoulder, we have the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff is four muscles, which are this over here on the left, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor. And actually, the other one is in red on the right, the subscapularis. And then we have our deltoid, which creates that nice little cap over both of our shoulders. 
and then the triceps, which are in the back, and the biceps, which are in the front. In the forearm, we have muscles that are involved with extension at the wrist and flexion at the wrist. So extension is essentially all along the back side of the forearm. And then on the, the front side of the forearm, it's all the muscles that are involved with flexion at the wrist. And then in the hands, we have muscles that are involved with making a fist, flexing our fingers out, our grip strength, and of course, our wonderful opposable thumb. All right, so rotate, rotator cuff tendonitis. So generally, you're going to feel pain kind of at the top of the shoulder and even radiating down into the upper arm. And that's because the shoulder is a ball and socket joint. And when something is affecting the ball and socket, you're going to feel it radiate down the ball or the humerus. Um, sometimes our painful range of motion, especially overhead or kind of out in this position or when you're reaching out, maybe to get that last shot. Um, popping in the shoulder can happen too, especially if there's underlying what's called calcific tendonitis. So some of the rotator cuff tendons can actually have little calcium deposits that happen over decades and that popping and clicking can actually cause irritation to the rotator cuff. Um, something that gradually kind of worsens over time too. So it kind of irritates you at first and then just gets, uh, okay, now it's really irritating me. Um, risk factors, so repetitive overhand motions, um, poor shoulder mechanics, so if you have a little bit of instability at baseline or maybe a known um, degenerative rotator cuff tear that can contribute to this too and the discomfort of rotator cuff tendonitis. And then some predisposing factors like um, hyperlipidemia and diabetes, these can just contribute to the risk of having degenerative tears overall in the rotator cuff outside of, outside of pickleball. Diagnosis, so usually by exam with an x-ray, that's where you look for that uh, calcific tendonitis or maybe some underlying arthritis, and then an MRI to possibly rule out a tear. Initial treatment, so doing things like pendulums and wall climbs where you go up or out to the side and just keep that range of motion. The shoulder is one of these joints, elbow two, that if you're not moving it, you'll lose it. Right? You don't want to lose that range of motion in the shoulder. And so if you're able to kind of push past the pain and make sure you maintain that range of motion, it's going to be very important. Um, ice, NSAIDs, rest. Um, and if still with pain, then consider coming and seeing an orthopedic and see, you know, do I need an MRI? Do I need to look for something else? Okay, so tennis elbow and golfer's elbow. So remember we talked about how like all the extensors go down and they actually attach right at the outside elbow there. Right? So we call it tennis elbow because when you practice your backhand too much, or you're flicking your arm back too much, you just irritate that area and it can just develop into tendonitis. On the opposite side of the elbow, the inside of the elbow is golfer's elbow. So remember we talked about how all the flexion that occurs at the wrist, all of those muscles, actually almost all of them, attach down here at the inside of the elbow. And so we, go, we call it golfers because you tend to some golfers tend to flex their wrist a bit as they swing through. And so you can see that a little bit more commonly in golfers. However, I've seen both in pickleball players. So um, it's can, a gradually worsening pain that you're gonna feel at either the outside or the inside of the elbow. And a lot of times people talk about difficulty opening jars um, or opening doors because those muscles are also involved um, and can just irritate that area. Uh, risk factor, so repetitive forceful movements playing for more than two hours a day. <laughs> That's some evidence-based medicine. I found an article that talked about that, that you're more likely to have tennis elbow if you pay, play more than two hours a day. Um, if you have a powerful backhand, right? So it's the tennis elbow, or if you have a powerful forehand, and that's gonna be more the golfer's elbow. Diagno diagnosis again, exam, x-ray, ultrasound, maybe to consider MRI if it's tenacious and just not getting better. And so initial treatment, ice, NSAIDs, stretches, Melinda's gonna talk a little bit about those. Um, topicals, again, you Voltaren gel, Asper cream, epicondyl or band. So these bands can help, but you don't wanna put them right at the source of pain. You actually wanna go just a little bit down so that it kind of compresses it and change the tension point and give that the point that's actually hurting a bit of a break. Um, and then official occupational therapy, you're seeing Melinda who does a wonderful job with um, this type of diagnosis. Another area that has a lot of evidence behind it is PRP. I don't know if you've heard of it before, but platelet-rich plasma is actually taken out of your own blood. And so you can come in and we'll draw out some blood. We spin it down in a machine and it separates out just your platelets. Platelets are actually inflammatory mediators. And what that means is when they're present, your body goes, oh, wait a minute. I need, I need to fix that. There's a lot of inflammatory mediators there, and I need to go there and fix that right now. 
Um, and so one of my colleagues calls it the healing juice, which I really like. I thought that's kind of a nice way to do it, but it's your own healing juice out of your own body. We just take it and put it right at the site of that lateral epicondylitis where the tendon looks most damaged and let your own body heal itself. Um, there's excellent evidence for this, helping with healing and pain of um, both lateral and medial epicondylitis. The downside is it's not covered by insurance and it runs about $867 um, per, per shot. Oftentimes the elbow only needs one shot, but every once in a while, sometimes you need a second one um, just to see if you can get treatment. All right, big stars again, right? So here we are, there's another major, very common injury with pickleball players, wrist sprains and fractures. And so um, just kind of a quick reminder, you've got the radius and the ulna in the wrist. Um, and then the carpals are the next row, and then the metacarpals and the phalanges. So the symptoms generally, it's, it's sudden onset. We call it a foosh injury, which is one of my favorite acronyms, fall on outstretched hand. Um, and it's, I'm a big foosher myself. I've, I've broken both my wrists, <laughs> not in pickleball, but biking um, and actually karate. Uh, and so wrist factors are poor balance, worn out footwear. So you might be slipping on the court instead of actually getting a grip. And so when you slip, you could fall. Uneven court or a wet court, because obviously it puts you at risk factor for slipping. Um, underlying osteoporosis. The reason I put that on there is because that makes a wrist sprain more likely to be a wrist fracture um, if you have some underlying um, osteopenia or osteoporosis. So again, exam, x-ray assessing for fracture versus sprain. And if still with persistent pain after six weeks or so, then you know you may, your um, physician may decide you might need an MRI just to see if there's something in there that's not healing. The initial treatment, obviously we love rice, right? So rest, ice, NSAIDs, using a brace or a cast um, and elevate just to make sure you can help with some of the swelling. I do the same thing. Instead of cast pumps, I say, you know, make sure you're kind of moving your hand to help just the fluid kind of come out of the fingers because sometimes the fingers can get really swollen, especially if we're hanging our arm down in that cast. Um, you can do a splint in some cases versus a brace um, or a cast versus surgical. You know, the wrist is a very delicate joint and, you know, if things aren't lined up perfectly, then it may mean that we have to have a surgical intervention right off the bat. Um, generally, occupational therapy is still going to be involved because I always say this, we rob Peter to pay Paul, you know, we put you in a cast to fix the bone, but then you're super stiff because you've been in the cast for, you know, five or six weeks. And so then you get to see Melinda um, and she helps work with you on range of motion. All right, so preventing injuries. I'm gonna switch over to Melinda now. So Melinda, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. And then, okay. Give me just a moment and I will start sharing. Here we go. Okay. And so I can talk to you guys. I'm sorry, I also have children, so you might hear them as well. Um, about injury prevention for pickleball and preparing mm -hmm. as well as healing from some of these injuries. Um, my name is Melinda Main. I'm one of the occupational therapists at Wentworth Douglas. And come on. Um, so as Dr. Hopp mentioned to you guys, uh, balance is a key important. I, I mainly treat occupational therapy treats upper extremities, but also how the majority of those happen is you fall or you go off balance and you try and catch yourself off to the side. So you want to work on balance activities regularly. Um, these can be standing on one foot. There's a lot of different programs out there for like balance and learning to balance and silver sneakers and things of that nature. Um, if you are having trouble, also things that help you stay up are if you're feeling well. If you're not feeling well, make sure you eat. If you're running out the door, stay hydrated. Um, you don't wanna get onto the actual court and say, wow, I didn't eat breakfast and I really kind of feel icky and set yourself up. Also, you wanna warm up before play and cool down after play. Some of that can shoot include walking, jogging the court length, stretching before and after the game or the practice if you're just out there playing around. Um, injuries happen by sudden movements, kind of 
accelerating quickly, decelerating quickly. They can happen to anybody at any time. Um, in alto blunt trauma, if you're hit by a pickleball or if you're playing teams and you're running into each other, then these can potentially bruise and aggravate the actual muscles. And as you can imagine, once that bruise is there, it may make you, if you keep playing without icing or stretching it, more susceptible to developing a tendonitis type injury. Um, and if you have a previous injury site, you're more at risk, um, know what your limits are. And if you start to feel it, start to calm, calm down, kind of go back to that, as Dr. Hoff referenced, the rice and resting and icing. Um, we talked about avoiding with a warm up walking or jogging the court one to two times. Um, dynamic stretching, and we'll go into that a little bit more as we get going, but just make it part of the routine. Upper and lower body are important. That's the UB and LBS, sorry, I should have it now. Um, so some of the things that you're gonna do during your court, the course of your activity there, is you're gonna be sidestepping and you're gonna be lunging out to the side. So practice these in a controlled manner. Make sure you feel comfortable doing them. Um, you can do them in the comfort of your own home. You can get better as the routine gets better and do it outside of your home or like as a warm up on the court. And this one here just shows you sidestepping to the side and kind of crossing your feet over in a braid. If you feel a little off balance doing that, that you don't have to fully cross over but you wanna practice these activities for during the play. This is also another nice basic balance activity is just sidestepping. So you're gonna complete kind of a lunge to the right and then a lunge to the left, go within your comfort range. Um, as you become better at this, you can increase your speed, which, and you can start alternating your sides to mimic during play. And that will help as well, just build that dynamic balance activities up in your tolerance to decrease the likelihood of you falling. Um, we talked a lot about upper extremity stretching and you do want to, I find this is kind of like where I end up harping most of my days is um, forearm stretches. My thing is we typically tend to use our hands and our upper extremities throughout our day. We wake up in the morning, we make our coffee, we pour our coffee, we get ourselves ready we check our email, we carry our phones and our purses, but we tend not to stretch our forearms. And if we can, so most of us go into injuries with a tight forearm to begin with in either the, um, both the flexors and the extensors that Dr. Hop was talking about. So these are some gentle stretches you'll see and two, you can work on coming down and then you can also work on going up. Um, one thing I, usually try and make sure people do is not to just pull on your fingers, but you actually kind of gently press on the back of your hand. Um, also, the other picture here shows doing some shoulder warm ups, kind of waking up those muscles, getting them warm and ready for play. That involves what some of the anatomy Dr. Hop talked about with your scapula, stabilizing that, getting the shoulder moving and the arms muscles are holding themselves out, which is actually a good warm up for the muscles. Um, stretching shouldn't hurt. If you're stretching so far that it's hurting, you're kind of pulling against yourself. So you, you wanna gently move into the stretch and then you wanna lay off the stretch. Um, and it, we're, the research has moved more towards dynamic stretching so that you're kind of moving, moving through the motion, moving into it and doing it a few repetitions to improve it. Um, so some lower extremity stretching that we talked about a lot of calf strains with Dr. Hop and hamstrings. So if you look at the image on the far left with the foot on the baseboard, she's stretching her calf. Um, you can do that kind of on anything. If there's a little bit of a curb around there or any of those nature um, thing, a fence that you can prop your foot, your toes up on. Uh, the other lady on the right is doing a hamstring stretch and kind of bending over. Um, you can put your foot, bring your toes up to aid in that and kind of guide how much tension you have. And again, moving into the stretch, pushing in and then laying off and pushing in again to improve it. 
putting it all together. You wanna to work the upper body and the lower body together, stretching and balance. Um, the people on the left are doing a quadricep stretch and they are kind of holding on to each other and balancing. You can also use a fence if you need to. Not everybody can stand on one foot. Um, this lady on your right is working her upper body and stretching as she does some kind of high knees to work both the body together. That also when you start to cross the body and working upper and lower starts to work on some of your balance. So with that, the preparation is your key to in success. You wanna do balance activities and dynamic stretching daily. Whether you're playing or not, it's just kind of to have a healthy routine. Good balance prevents falls on and off the court which can prevent injuries. And you wanna prevent injuries while you're playing, but you also wanna prevent injuries at home so that you can continue to play and stay active. Um, stretching's important before and after you play. It's important to stretch once you're warmed up. So when your muscles are warm, they're a little more pliable and will be a little bit more likely to give. Um, after play, you allows your muscles to kind of uncoil from the tightness developed during play. And like Dr. Hopp had said, make sure you kind of look at where it hurts and what you hurt. So if you're looking online, you can kind of reference, okay, I need to stretch this or I need to stretch that. And look, um, find out if that's gonna give and if your muscles continue to be aggravated, then we can look into see, seeing Dr. Hopp or orthopedics to get a more formal diagnosis. And most importantly, you wanna have fun and stay active in play.